Hey, New Patient Group Nation, welcome inside the broadcast booth. Brian right here. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 13. On the road today, taking the broadcast booth on the road here in Los Angeles and going to be duplicating this podcast over on our YouTube station because it'll allow you to see the, the nice, beautiful view I'm looking at. Looking at LAX Airport, nice Air, Air France, Airbus uh, just landed there and we're seeing planes taxiing and taking off. Really a beautiful sight. So if you want to check it out, you can go over to our YouTube station. And got a good episode for you today. Going to be talking about behavioral change. As you know, we talk a lot about uh, the top 1%, how to overcome uh, a lot of the things the 99%ers just will not overcome. And a lot of that is, is as humans, you hear me talk about it quite often, uh, we are wonderful at seeking new information, but we are not so good at making sure the new information received becomes an embedded methodology in our business through training, repetition, accountability, et cetera. Well, today we're going to talk about the three types of people I've identified in businesses over the years. And we're also going to go into some five stages, some just some stages of behavioral change and where people are at in their minds when you're trying to change something, whether it be the new patient phone call, whether it be management, you listening out there, doctors, when we're trying to change you with our doctor CEO training, we're all going through these psychological changing behaviors in our head. And different people are in different stages along the way. So I'm going to define those to you. We're going to go into depth and have a conversation about those. Also, at the end of today, uh, I'm going to put everybody through our training or trainable culture challenge, okay? Something we do with all of our clients. And it really brings to light uh, whether or not you have the right people working for your organization. Really sheds a different picture uh, on the whole image of practice growth. So before we get started, let's fire up the music. Welcome to the New Patient Group Podcast, where doctors and other healthcare professionals crush their competition with innovative business, marketing, psychology, and entrepreneurial strategies. Learn how to better the patient experience, improve employee and management performance, and how to best increase conversions, efficiencies, referrals, profitability, revenue, and more. Learn from five-star customer service, psychology, business, and marketing gurus top producing clinicians, and the most successful entrepreneurs throughout a multitude of industries. Now your hosts, practicing doctor and president of OfficeAutomated.com, Robert Barton, and the CEO of New Patient Group, consultant and speaker for Align Technology, the makers of Invisalign, author for the Benson Koppel Resource, featured in the Dental Economics Ask the Expert section, and international five-star customer service guru and life coach, with companies featured in Forbes, CNBC, and the National Journal, Brian Wright. Hey, everybody. Welcome inside the broadcast booth. Brian Wright here. I'll be riding solo today. And like I said at the intro, going to be diving into behavioral pattern changes. And one of the things that makes change so difficult is the fact that a lot of team members, you got to remember this, you're dealing with a lot of different personalities that also include yourself. And most everybody inside an organization is in a different stage in terms of being ready to change. And I want to start off today, before I get to really the three types that we've identified in the business environment, types of people, I want to get into the stages of change and talk to you about why it's important to understand why each person is in a different stage when it comes to being ready for change. And really the very first stage of behavioral change, so I want to dive right in today, is pre-contemplation. And really what this stage is, is really the phase that you can relate to as denial. You know, the alcoholic that has a drinking problem but just refuses to admit it. Uh, The person that's overweight and just refuses to admit it. Things like that. They're in a denial stage. So these people are the ones inside the practice that absolutely refuse to believe that there are any problems whatsoever. Everything is perfect. We close 100% of the patients that walk in. Every single patient that enters the practice refers us at least three more. Uh, The way... They talk on the phone call, the way they present money. Every word that comes out of their mouth is just genius, and there's absolutely no reason to change. Or what we see in a lot of times, we get these practices. I shouldn't say a lot of times, but there are times where we're working with a practice that's extremely busy. They have just the doors are just knocking over. And we hear, wow, we're we're this busy and we're we're gonna change. That's just that's just crazy. Everything is just rosy. And that is the pre-contemplation stage. So whenever you're trying to introduce change to these types of people, imagine the difficultiness from a consultant perspective, how that's actually going to go using a make-believe name. Let's say Betty is this type of person and you have a conversation with Betty about 
uh, even starting small, three things that you need to change on the new patient phone call. And Betty's been doing this for quite some time. Again, the doors are just blowing up. And maybe your, your practice isn't even busy. Now, there's some that uh, may be getting ready to go out of business or you're somewhere in between. Whatever your stage is as a practice, there usually is one or two employees on the team. And many times it's management. And that is the difficult part of this is that a lot of times – the teams want to change, but it's management that is in that pre-contemplation stage. Then a lot of times it's the opposite. Management wants to, wants to change, but the team is in the pre-contemplation stage. So very, very few times do you actually have people in an organization, both management and the team, that are all not in the stage, okay? Usually it's one or the other, all right? Team is, but very few times is everybody ready to go fully on board with change. All right, the next one, and we're not going to go in depth about how to solve each one of these today, but I do want to go through these stages because it's important for you to know whenever you hire a consultant, whether it's my company, New Patient Group, whether it's somebody else, a barrier to them succeeding with your organization are these stages, and it is also the three people uh, that we've identified and I've identified in my career in the business, and regardless of the business environment, if you go in to help uh, grow a restaurant, you're going to deal with the same type situation as you do when you go into a dental practice, orthodontic practice, etc. It, it is a very similar thing. Contemplation. There are waiters that think they are waiting tables the perfect way. They don't need to change. No different than a lot of people with inside the practice environment. So that pre-contemplation stage obviously makes it difficult for change to occur because no different than the alcoholic example that I gave you. If you're an alcoholic, the only way you are going to stop being an alcoholic is if you yourself admit there's a problem or you yourself say, you know what, there's a better way of doing things. That's the only way that change is going to inevitably happen is if you admit it yourself. It is no different than if you want to lose weight. If you're a person who is 350 pounds, as an example, and you don't see that you're overweight, you don't see that as a problem, then you are not going to lose weight. It doesn't matter what personal trainer you hire. It doesn't matter what consultant you hire. The weight is not going to come off with people telling you that you're overweight. The weight comes off as a beginning stage of you saying, hey, look, I'm overweight. I need to make a change. So that pre the contemplation stage is that barrier of your team members or employees on your team or management simply going, you know what, we don't think that's a problem. Whether it be our people answering the phones, whatever it might be, we don't view it as a problem. So if that's the case, change is not going to occur successfully in your organization. You have to have people that are open-minded to saying, look, no matter how good I believe I am, no matter how good I believe our team is, there is always a better way. There's a more efficient way. There's a more up-to-date way of doing things. And the contemplation stage, that is the next one. Now, contemplation is a funny one. It's a very ironic one because the contemplation stage is when people begin to see the benefits of change, okay? They're starting in their mind to go, you know what, I, I might have a drinking problem here. Uh, that's the analogy. But they're starting to see the benefits, whether that be they've been forced to change, whether they were ready for it or not. They hate the change, but all of a sudden in their mind, they go, you know what? This is working better. So the contemplation stage, like I was saying, is when people begin to see the benefits of change, but they oftentimes become even more resistant to it then in the pre-contemplation stage, the, re the reason for this is, is they realize they were wrong in the beginning and they don't want to admit it. Now think about that for a second. That's powerful. It's a powerful statement. You have the pre-contemplation phase where people just flat out say, look, there's no problem, buddy. Get out of here. Don't need it. Don't want it. Everything is fine. Then you have, so we'll use the, the, the alcoholic example. So you have the pre-contemplation pre stage where the alcoholic is saying, no, no problem, you know, to their family. Family, look, stop telling me that I have a problem. I don't. I'm fine. I can control it. I can drink a little here and there. I'm going to be perfectly fine. Family is constantly bombarding the person with, no, there's a problem. They refuse to believe it. Then you have the contemplation stage where that alcoholic goes, you know what? I think, uh, I think I might have an issue or I see by not drinking, I'm, I'm feeling better. 
All right, so they're starting to recognize it. But then they have this trigger in their mind that goes, absolutely under no circumstances am I going to admit it. And that is what the contemplation stage is. And we see it from a consulting standpoint, we see it a lot. And we're good at what we do, so we can tell the people in what stage or phase they are as far as their, their behavioral changing patterns. Are they ready? Are they not? Is it too soon? Etc. But the contemplation phase is a funny one because we can see people who are extremely stubborn, that refuse to see the light, all of a sudden go, you know what? There is a light. But there isn't a chance in a blue moon that I'm going to let these people know about it. So this stage, they become argumentative far more than the pre-contemplation phase. They become uncertain about their future, which they become insecure because of that. And all kinds of cultural problems can exist because of the contemplation phase. Now, also, uncertainty sets in about what the future of the whole organization might look like. Forget just their career. But they're starting to see, hey, look, this could work. But there isn't a chance that I'm going to let anybody know it because of that pre-contemplation phase. So, not only am I talking about individual stages, a lot of times these work in order. All right? So, let's say we come into an organization. All right? Not always does someone that's against change start in the pre-contemplation phase. What I mean by that is, is you may never even start with that phase. We may come into your practice and your team may already be at the contemplation phase, meaning they may say, you know what? We think change could help. That might work. We can see how five-star customer service in a little bit different way can get us more referrals and make us more efficient and things like that. We can see it. But you know what? The future is uncertain about my career if they start training me. Or I'm going to fight this just because, look, it's been this way for 20 years and I'm not going to let an outsider come in and change the way I do my stuff. That might be where they start. Or they may start in the pre-contemplation phase and we may help or whatever consultant you're dealing with or just you leading your team you may get them out of the pre-contemplation phase, which was what repetition and accountability does, into the contemplation phase. And like I said, there's going to be other podcasts that say, hey, look, if they're in the contemplation phase, what are the steps to get them out of that? We're not going to talk about that today. Today, we're going to talk about the strategy, okay? The what. The next one is the preparation phase, all right? There are teams that we walk into and they are committed to change. That's what the preparation phase is, all right? So again, you have two ways that the preparation phase sets in. Either you walk in and the team is in the preparation phase or employees on the team are in the preparation phase. And that's really the reality of the situation. And what I was talking about earlier is that almost every team, not 100%, but if I was going to bet a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or a million dollars i would bet that a team that we walk into tomorrow has a is a combination of all the ones i'm talking about right now all right you've got your people that are in the pre-contemplation phase you have your people that are starting off in the contemplation phase and you have your people that are starting off in the preparation phase rarely is everybody in the same phase all right, so the preparation phase is an employee or a team or a management team or all the above that's going, you know what? We're ready for change. Let's do this. All right, now here's the issue. I've seen it time and time again where people think they're ready for change. In their mind, they're like, you know what? This innovation thing and doing things unique to the healthcare profession uh, training on true five-star customer service, really getting help from experts in the business commercial marketing components of my practice. That makes sense to me. We're ready for this change, all right? So in their mind, they're ready for the change, not knowing what the change actually is. Change is tough, guys. Change is not easy. Change is not easy at all. So it's one thing to say I'm ready for it. It's another thing to actually do it. And what I'm getting at is, is that we have seen many times management teams, this actually happens more than the employees, it happens with the employees, but it really happens with management, where management goes ready for change. In the first few months, man, they're all on board, they're saying the right things. And all of a sudden, 
all of a sudden, out of the blue, pre-contemplation hits or contemplation hits. Usually, it goes backwards, meaning that contemplation hits all of a sudden out of the blue where they go, you know what? Things are changing. I do see it getting better, but you know what? I'm afraid of the uncertainty of what the future looks like for my business, even if in their mind, the business can look good in the future to them. Everything becomes uncertain to them because this is something maybe they've grown their business for the past 20 years. In comes a consultant. Things are going well. And the doctor feels like they're losing control. Wait a minute. The team's looking to the consultant for leadership and things like that. I don't like it. So then contemplation sets in. And then what happens is it works backwards. Then the next thing you know is the pre-contemplation phase sets in. And I see this. A lot of you listen out there are going, are you nuts? What? Listen to yourself. <laughs> and it makes me laugh because I've seen this time and time again from business owners all over the place where they tell us, look, change is happening. We're here to do it. Let's rock and roll. And six months into it, you're at the pre-contemplation phase where now they act as if there was never any problems to begin with. They never said how great you were doing or how motivating this has been or all the chains that have grown the numbers, they act like they never needed help to begin with and they were never on board with the change. And I know it sounds crazy, but as humans, we're a little nuts when it comes to change. Change makes us do crazy things. So inevitably now what I'm talking about is, is that you could be a person that's in any one of these phases at the start. You could be the pre-contemplation phase. You could be in the contemplation phase. You could be in the preparation phase. You could even be in the action phase, which is the next one that I'm going to talk about. All right? But you could also be one of these people that are in the preparation phase in the beginning and then go backwards. As you see things progress, it actually is a deterrent psychologically because you feel like you're losing control of the business that you grew the best you knew how for a long time. This is why, this, this will prove the point. This is why I tell people this all the time. If, if I had to get compliments, this would be one of the last businesses I would ever choose to be in. If I needed the, oh my God, Brian. It, for those of you who ever see Restaurant Impossible, Chef Robert Irvine. If you've never seen the show, it's on the Food Network. They actually went off the air for a couple years. They closed the show, but it was so popular they brought it back. It's a great show. He goes in and he saves failing restaurants, all right? Changes the food, the decor, the training, blah, blah, blah. Well, at the end, not all, but at the end of most of them, you know, the business owners are crying. They're jumping up and down. They're hugging them. They're thanking them. That doesn't happen inside the healthcare environment. What happens is usually two things, and we're cool with it. It's not a complaint. It just, it is what it is, and why, if you're looking for compliments, this is not the uh, industry to be in, is it usually one or two things happens, is that one, the doctor and team convince themselves, you know, they do everything that we say, and then they convince themselves that we had nothing to do with it. They grow like crazy. And, but it was all them, which is true. And that's the case is it's true because without them doing what we teach, there's not going to be growth. So inev and inevitably it is them, but you get the point. The other one is, is that they don't do anything we say. They fight everything and they don't succeed. They may grow a little, but com in comparison to the clients that actually listen and do things, they obviously don't come close. And then though, in those circumstances where they, they don't listen, they don't do anything, they blame us for the failure. And that's the business we're in. But that is what I'm talking about with these behavioral changes is that the preparation phase, that's why people go backwards sometimes. It's, it's crazy to think, but it happens. So you have this pre-contemplation phase with people that just refuse to admit there's a problem. You have those people on the team. Then you have your contemplation phase with those people on the team. Then you have the preparation phase, the go-getters. They're ready to go. But then something can happen. Now, all the time. So I don't want to say it happens every time. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it can happen. I mean, any day of the week, we would take a team in the preparation phase when we come in over anything else. But understand, this is where consultants fail so bad. If you have a team of 10 and seven of them are in the pre-contemplation phase, 
then explain to me how a six-month relationship is going to do you any good or a three-month relationship. Heck, you could make the argument that a year is not enough. But the point is, and that is why I created New Patient Group, to be more of an integrated and integral part of the organization as opposed to somebody that you know comes and goes, gives you a bunch of ideas that are probably good. But then, heck, how is the pre-contemplation team ever going to implement them? It is just flat out not going to happen. You guys know it as well as me. You can't shove change down people's throat. They have to be ready for it, which is why management is so important because management has to set the table of being ready for it. They have to define the accountability measures. They have to define what's going to happen to you if you don't change. But the issue with that is, is a lot of times management is the issue. And office managers out there, you know I love you, but a lot of times it's the office manager going, you know what, this is the way I've done it for 20 years. You're not telling me what to do. You're not going to train me on my management style. You're not going to do A, B, and C. And it's such a different mindset, again, from entrepreneurs and great ones who are always out there asking other people, what can I do to change? What can I do to get better? And entrepreneurs, the really good ones, are always in that preparation phase. They're always in the action phase, which is the next one. So you get into the action phase after the preparation phase. Action is when you're doing, okay? You've implemented, you know, our employee performance indicators that you've heard me talk about. It's like, okay, we're actually doing them. We're tracking them. We're entering them. You know, we've actually implemented the phone call. Maybe not well, but we're doing it. We're trying to get better, all right? We're following the six steps. We're following the consumer language, the value-based language. We're taking control. All those things our receptionist course is so popular for. We're doing it, okay? And at any level, you could be doing it at a two level or an eight level. You're still in the action phase. All right, now once you're in the action phase, that's when change really starts happening because you guys know this just as good as me. Ever getting to the action phase is difficult. You can talk with people all you want, all day long, about please, thank you, my pleasure. You know, the simple things of customer service that make such a significant impact, only if everybody does it. But getting everybody to do it is difficult. And until your employees all do it, it does not make you famous. I just had this conversation with a practice I was in a couple days ago in Baltimore. Please thank you, my pleasure does not make Chick-fil-A famous. Please thank you, my pleasure has made Chick-fil-A famous because of the system of everybody following. Everybody follows that system. The system is what's made him famous. The idea is not what has made him famous. The fact that everybody follows it, that is what's made that, that's what makes him famous. So you're in this action phase, which is an accomplishment in itself, okay? Then you're in what we all absolutely stink at is the maintenance phase. Now, this is what I call the consistency, repetition, accountability phase that so many organizations fail. That is, out of everything I'm talking about, and you've heard me say it, and I'm not going to say it that many times. Because that is the one that actually makes all of this work. That is what makes all of this work, is the repetition, accountability, and maintenance phase. And that also can set people back to the contemplation and the pre-contemplation phase. That's what's so ironic about all this because if you're doing it right, you're doing these things on a repetitive, ongoing, consistent basis forever. So you, let's say I've seen this time and time again. We have clients that have been with us four, five, six, almost our entire existence. We're in our seventh year as a company. We have other ones that have been with us two or three years. And I see it. And it goes something like this. No matter where you start as a team, pre-contemplation, contem whatever it is, if you're with us long enough, we will get you to the action and maintenance phase. We know how to do it. But my point is, is that let's say, make-believe name, Nancy, 
who answers the phones. And you guys know about reciprocity. You know about the neural impact. You know about all this stuff that we talk about. People resort back to how they used to do things, which is, is really ties into all this. But the issue now is in the maintenance phase, what you're going to find, it's going to happen to you too, is you're going to have this day where you go, man, this seems repetitive. Or man, God, my team's good at this. Do we, do we really need this anymore? You're going to have that moment. It's inevitable. Now, the one percenters absolutely have it in their mind and they are embedded of understanding that yes, it is. The 99 percenters, when they have that you know, inclination, they go, no, it's not. Let's seek something new. And you guys know, I'm not saying don't seek something new. We want you seeking new things. We just want you, when you're seeking new things, to not only be able to implement it, but while you're implementing it and getting it right, all the other things that you've done and throughout your other career, you know, of traveling to people's facilities, going to events, implementing our stuff, another consultant stuff, whatever it might be, we want to make sure all of those things remain well in your organization. And that is what people just are not good at. They seek the new and meanwhile the old goes right down the toilet or the old was never properly implemented at a high level to begin with. So what happens with that maintenance phase is you go backwards. Nancy, the receptionist, says, hey, boss, why are we doing this? We just practice this. I'm good at this. We don't need this anymore. And bam. That statement right there puts you right back into the pre-contemplation phase. There's no problem. I don't need this. No problem at all. Don't know why we're doing this. Makes no sense. And bam, you are all the way back at stage one that it could have taken you a year or two years to actually get out of with your whole team. The moment that the, and, and this happens, it happens inevitably to every single business that tries to do it the way the top 1% does it. For those of you who don't always listen to this podcast, when I say top 1%, I am not referencing the healthcare environment. I am referencing really any famous business that comes to your mind, regardless of the industry you think of. Coffee, Starbucks pops in your mind. Certainly not because their coffee is the best, but because they do the things that I am talking about. Ritz Carlton, Walt Disney. And I don't want to go into more depth about that because our, fo our loyal followers hear this until they're blue in the face. However, just like you guys know me talking about, repetition breeds greatness. That's the reason why the most famous athletes do it. And that is the mentality you must have from a behavioral change standpoint. It absolutely is a necessity. Otherwise, it goes all the way back to the pre-contemplation phase. The I don't recognize there's a problem. Because the problem always exists. See, that's why the alcohol thing is such a great analogy. Because that's why a lot of people relapse. Oh, I can have one now. It's just one drink. You know, I've, I haven't been drinking in a long time. I've got this. I'm just going to have a sip. Meanwhile, that sip sets you right back into the pre-contemplation phase and it starts all over again. Weight loss phase. You know what? I'm doing great. I'm going to have that donut. I'm going to have two donuts. I'm going to have 10. Whatever it might be, there's always a problem. The problem, just like we said, the neural impact talks about how we as humans always resort back to how we used to do things. It's the science of it. Now, for you, it could be three years from now and you resort back to it. For me, it may be tomorrow, but it's inevitable you will resort back. And that is the, that is the problem. So if Nancy has gotten the phone call down just beautifully, it doesn't mean that she has to practice it every single week. It doesn't mean that she has to practice it every single month. But she better practice it consistently for the rest of her career if you as a boss expect her to remain at a high level. So that is the problem. The problem is, is if you don't consistently do it, it will go back to how it was before you ever invested in it to begin with. So if Susie's allowed to take that one drink, it's all over for you. If you as management stop holding your people accountable because you think everything is fine, then that's the equivalent of having that one drink. It goes all the way back. Now, does it go back to the pre-contemplation phase? Maybe not, but it definitely goes back. And see, that's the, that's the magic of all this. 
If you have an employee that's in the pre-contemplation phase, you have to bring them through this journey all the way to the maintenance phase. If you have an employee that starts at the contemplation phase, you still have to bring them all the way through the journey of the maintenance phase. But see, it all ties back to management to ensuring the maintenance phase exists at all times. And that's difficult because a lot of times management, you are the problem. You're the one that thinks, I don't know if this repetition and consistency is necessary anymore. And the second you say that, it's over for your organization. It will go back to the pre-contemplation phase. And this, this phase is so psychologically amazing to me because of how it can start in the preparation phase and it can jump backwards or it can jump forwards. And then years down the road, go all the way back to the pre-contemplation phase when maybe that's not how it started. Maybe Nancy can't wait to change enough. Man, we're going to get to talk to experts on five-star customer service and consumer psych. They're, they're going to actually get teach me that? I get to learn that stuff? Now, those types of employees are few and far between, but they do exist, and I just love working with those people. But the thing is, is that is the preparation phase. They are ready for action, all right? They're already in the preparation phase. They're ready for the action phase, the doing, all right? Let me implement this. Let me start doing it. This is awesome. But then they become really good because they're willing to. They become really good, and you keep working on it with them, and they get better and better and better, and then boom, just like I was talking about before, they go, you know what? This company had nothing to do with this. I was like this all along. And we see this all the time. We see it with doctor. Oh, I've, I've been the best CEO all along. You had nothing to do with it. And we're okay with that. As long as you succeed and you remain successful by growing considerably every year, we're fine with that. But the point is, is people are all over the place and they can go backwards, forwards. They can go back to a stage that they didn't even begin in because in that Nancy example, she'll get to a point where she'll go, I'm awesome at this. I don't need to practice anymore. And that is why we so often use the athlete analogy of an athlete never says that ever. And people just go, okay, you're nuts. You know, that's athlete. This is a business. But somebody explain to me the difference between an athlete's performance and an employee's performance. There is no difference. The ones who practice the most are the greatest. The ones who are the most consistent are the greatest. It is no different than you running your company or your employees making sure they maximize the success of your company. And employees out there listening, you know this. We talk about it all the time, whether it be the PDW events whether it be other events I speak at or just our on-site coaching program, our webinar coaching program, whatever it might be. You know this. We're not all about jamming. And that's what such a failed consultant model. Oh, we got to produce more. We got to start more treatment. We got to do all this. Let's analyze your production and blah, blah, blah. And they do that because they don't understand what other, num what other numbers to track. And that's not the way to get employees from pre-contemplation to contemplation, et cetera. Talking numbers doesn't do it. This is all, again, to improve the employee's career because the better their career is, the more money they're going to make, the more prosperous they're going to be. And in turn, the better your patients are going to be treated or whatever customers you have out there for your other business owners that listen to this. The more your employees accept change, the better your customers, clients, patients will be treated. It's inevitable. Which is why these stages... They don't necessarily teach you how to go from one stage to the next, how to get out of one particular stage, but it's important for you to know them because there's reasons why we are just not good at it. And we study it hard because in order for our clients to get the most out of our program, these things have to occur. I mean, do you really think that we're going to have success with your organization if you have a team stuck in the pre-contemplation phase? Explain to me how you're going to succeed with our program or any other consultant's program that you hire. It's not going to happen. This is why it just drives me nuts in, in, in today's, because you talk about this all the time, is that there's never been a time where a practice has to be run like a business first. And really, in, in, the, in the situation, it's kind of unfortunate. You know, in the real, in a perfect world, the best clinician would win, but it's just not the case because people don't know if you're a good clinician or not until the end result. And even then it's difficult for them to tell because they just don't know what you know. 
So therefore, you have to run it like a high-end business first. It's so, so important to understand that. And that's what drives me crazy. We still get clinicians and be like, ah, you guys do the webinar trainings or not. You guys do that. And that's not the way it works anymore. There was a time that was fine, but it's not fine anymore. It's just not. And this is all so, so important to maximize in the success of your personal career, of your business, and really the ultimate goal that we all care the most about, at least I hope you do, is making sure that every patient, every consumer that has any touch point with your operation is given such a wow factor via every single aspect of every touch point they have with your organization. Don't you want to be that company? Where the person gets off the phone with your receptionist and goes, wow, (laughs) those people clearly train them. Don't you want to be that organization? Well, this is what gets you there, but it won't if your team and you are in one of these stages outside of the preparation or beyond. Now, for a long time, we've been doing this every type of business. And there's three types of people and really how they deal with change. And I I call them champs, chumps, and potentials. All right. Really my chumps is kind of my chuckle word. It's really blockers is my real name for it, but I'm thinking about changing it. It just makes sense because champs and chumps, it kind of, kind of goes together. But people deal with change in these three ways. You have your champs and I think you know where I'm going. These are the people that really already start off in the phase that I was talking about earlier, that preparation phase. They're already there and they're always there. They're they're the ones that are, you just wish you could clone them, right? You wish if you had, you know, you could take Nancy, she's the champ, you could duplicate her 50 times and your whole organization is her. And there's usually always at least one on a team, no matter how small the team or how big the team, usually at least one. Now, not only do you want to clone them, they're just your ideal person. They help you build a better culture. They show up on time. You never have a you never have any issues getting them to do what you want them to do. They're always on board. They understand it's your business, it's your dream, and they're going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. They don't even necessarily ask for more money in the process, but those ironically are the people out there and employees listening. Here's the thing. If you want to get the most money in your career, be the champ. Because the champs really never even has to ask for a raise. It just organically happens. They get bigger bonuses. They get better raises. And they end up making more money than the one that's just a pain always asking for a raise. Because the champs deserve it. Now, these are people that can also be brought down. And I've seen this countless amounts of times. There's management listening out there. Whatever company you're bringing in to help grow your practice. You will ruin your champs by not holding the next two types of people accountable. You bring the champs down. I've seen champs quit. I've seen people hire champs and they're like three weeks in, I'm not dealing with this, I'm out of here. Or three weeks in, they become like this next one and I call them the chumps or the blockers. These are the people that are constantly telling you why it won't work. They bring others down in the process. And that I see it time and time again. You hire this bubbly, joyful person and they're just rocking and rolling. And then the blockers just bring them down. They suck them into the culture, into the environment. And a couple things happen. Either now your champ goes to a blocker or to a chump or they quit, which is a good thing if they quit, if they're being brought down to a chump level because you're just going to have another one of those in your hands. So you have your champs You have your chumps, and then you have your potentials. Now, athletes out there, sorry, sports fans out there, you know where I'm going with this. You hear that that, uh, great talent, boy, he or she has such potential to be great. If they just do the right things and they commit and they work hard, boy, oh boy, this person could be my best employee. You all have one of those out there, maybe two or three. Every sports organization has one of those. 
They have all the talent in the world. Maybe they're really good looking. They speak really well, but they may be lazy. They may make careless mistakes. They may not pay attention to detail. All of those things that could turn them into a champ or a famous athlete or a fabulous employee. But it's just potential. They're not there yet. And until they stop making those mistakes, they honestly have the ability to go into the blocker, the chump mode, or they can be champs. And that's where management, how you handle your business, can make or break the potentials. The people that just simply could make it versus not making it. And that's how you have accountability measures in place, proper employee reviews. It's so funny. I was talking about this with a client the other day. You know, one of the best ways to grow an organization is human resources. And I've yet in 20 years in healthcare ever ever seen one practice have their HR properly. Even the even the bigger corporations that we that we consult with from time to time. They don't have HR right either. They at least do it. But how it's really supposed to be done, they still lose countless amounts of opportunities. But the point is is HR is one of the top ways to grow a business. Do you think we've ever gotten a call that says, you know, hey, Brian, looking to grow my practice, can you help us with HR? <laughs> it just, it doesn't happen, you know, but it should. And our practice, for those of you out there listening and have our practice virtual platform, you know how much it's transformed your organization for those that use the human resources pieces of it. It actually gives you a real legitimate HR department that has your business functioning at higher levels through proper employee reviews, write-ups, warnings, communication, note to files, and more too. But the point being is, is if you have the right HR, you can take potentials and turn them into champs. If you don't have the right HR, the right way to, to review employees, to document systems, to document whether or not people are following the system, you'll turn the potentials into chumps, into the blockers. And you know what? It's your fault. It's not their fault. It's yours. It's your responsibility as management to help make people great. 10, 15 years ago, did it really matter? No, but it certainly matters now because the best business wins. And all of this just ties into the knowledge. The more knowledge you have of all this, it ties into understanding why change is so hard, but also where you have to be as an organization in order to make the change work for you. The pre-contemplation doctor out there, we deal with them when they hire. How do you think that goes? You know, it's the denial. It's the denial stage. All of that. But understand, no matter where you are, it can always go back. And don't let that happen. And that is one of many reasons we exist, is to constantly be pushing and saying, don't let it happen. Now, all of this ties into our trainable culture challenge. This is something I've done with businesses for years. And it's not rocket science. However, it is going to paint an instant image of whether or not you have the right people. Now, whenever you figure out if you don't have the right people, then you've got to make, you got to make a decision. Do you continue on with the wrong people or do you make a change? Even if that change is painful, do you make a change? And that's to you decide. Now, our clients listening out there, you know how much this exercise has helped you guys. It's a game changer. Like I said, it's, it's an easy one. I'm going to give it to you right now. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to take a piece of paper. This is a manual deal. I don't want you doing this digitally. All right. I want you to take a piece of paper. And you guys know our number. I've given out my contact information before. All right. NPG, our company abbreviated, NPG at newpatientgroup.com. I want you to put in the subject line, culture challenge. All right. I want you to put culture challenge in the subject line. When I get that email, what I'm going to do is have my director of client relations reach out to me and say, hey, look, we've got culture challenge Dr. A or restaurant owner A has reached out 
And I want to go through the results with you, all right? Because there's some very specific things that are going to take place in your mind whenever you go through this. And here's what the exercise is. I want you to take a piece of paper. Now, if you're a very large organization, you may need multiple pieces of paper. And you're going to draw a line down the middle of it. And you're going to title the left side trainability. And you're going to title the right side culture. And the first step, you are going to write down all the employees in your organization that you believe are trainable. They'll listen. They'll do it. You know, they're in that, that preparation phase. They're not in the contemplation or pre-contemplation phase. They're already there. They'll listen. They'll take the constructive criticism. Write them all down. Then, on the right side, you're going to write down all the employees that you believe show up every day and help build a better, more positive culture. Then what you're going to do is you're going to compare both sides. And any employee that doesn't show up on both is not the right person for your organization. It's difficult. And healthcare is a business where we hear it all the time. GP practices. Oh, boy, that hygienist. She's our highest producer. We can't let her go. Orthodontic practices. Whew, gosh, that assistant, man. She's so good. So good. We can't let her go. Meanwhile, those people are complainers. And I'm just giving these as an example, of course. But we really do hear it. They're complainers. They're not trainable. They won't listen. They're basically stuck in the pre-contemplation phase or the contemplation phase, or they go back and forth. They hover between both. That's one I didn't talk about before is the ones the we call them the hoverers. They go from one to the next almost daily. It's like they show up with a different mood type thing. But your organization to become on a growth autopilot needs 100% of its employees listed on both sides of that trainability culture challenge. Now, I want you to do this exercise, and I want you to email me culture challenge to npg at newpatientgroup.com, like I said. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go through the exercise with you after you're done. I want to have that conversation because you're going to be going in your mind. You're going to go, what do I do? Because you may be in a situation where none of your employees are on either side of it. You may be in a situation where if you're, you know, you have 10 employees, maybe five of them are on either side of it. What do you do? I got this Brian guy saying, I got it. I'm not telling you to terminate your entire organization, but what I'm trying to do is paint an image in your mind of where you're at as an organization from a team standpoint. Because these are the type challenge courses that the Starbucks of the world, Ritz Carlton's of the world do. Do you think Ritz Carlton goes, boy, you know what? Billy is just, he's just good with the customer. But man, oh man, he's constantly fighting management, causes culture issues. Do you think Ritz Carlton's going to keep that person? Of course not. So I always say what, what, what Billy's doing is causing five other people at the Ritz to not be as good with the customers they otherwise would be because the culture is brought down because of him. So it's all these lost opportunities. Your hygienist that you think is such a great producer, well, guess what? She may produce, but she's also costing three of your other hygienists from producing as much as they otherwise would if she was gone. Again, just an analogy, but you get the point. I want to go through that exercise with you, but I want you guys to, to do it. Every business owner out there, office managers listening, do this exercise. And you may find some of the people that you think are your best employees, they end up not showing up on either side. Guess what? They're not your best employee. Don't tell me they're your highest producer. You've got to forget the numbers. Just like we've talked about, those numbers, they don't, in the scheme of things, they don't matter. If she's your highest producer today, guess what? She's costing you thousands of dollars in other areas that you can't put your finger on. All of these things, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance, they all have to be in harmony, guys. They've got to be in the preparation, action, maintenance phase. Your whole team's got to be there got to be there you have to be there and you can't go back it's so easy to go back you can't go back don't let it happen don't be that person that lets it happen 
the champs, chumps, blockers, and potentials. All of those fit into those stages of behavioral patterns and change. Management. If you've got the potentials, you all have one. You know who I'm talking about. It's up to you to make sure they become a champ, not a chump, not a blocker. Ten years ago, was it? No, but it is now. You have to run a business. You have to have HR right. You've got to have your five-star customer service right. And if you're somebody that goes, ah, we're good at customer service, you are in the pre-contemplation phase because it's not about being good. It's about being great and famous, but it's always about improving. Good is not enough. Great is not enough. And even once you're famous, you got to still work at it. Otherwise, you'll go back to good. All of these things are so important for you to understand from a business owner standpoint, from employees, you listening out there. You may be somebody that's stuck in that pre-contemplation phase. Don't be that person. Or don't be that person that goes, you know what? These guys may be right, but there's no way I'm telling them. That's the contemplation phase. Don't be that person. And it's funny because no matter how many times you talk about what the famous entrepreneurs do to become famous, people are still like, nah, don't want anything to do with it. Learn, read, listen to podcasts. Not just mine, listen to others. You will prosper in life. You will become famous. Now, I say famous. Doesn't I'm not talking about the whole world's going to know you. What I'm talking about is you'll be famous within your organization. If you're able to get to that maintenance phase and not go back, that maintenance phase of change, and be a champ inside the office. Help people. Don't be the office manager that wants to keep all the knowledge inside her head, doesn't want to tell anybody. Be the office manager that makes everybody great. Be the employee that helps make other people great. Be the employee that's constantly learning. You work for a doctor that went to years of school, came out in debt, and is working in a time where I believe is the best time ever to own a practice. Some people think I'm nuts for saying that, but the reason being is all this stuff that we talk about, if you do it at a high level, you can't be stopped. I don't care if there's a practice 20 of them all lined up next door to you. You can't be stopped. Is it going to happen in a year? Maybe. Maybe not. Two years? Probably. But the point is, is you have to have a vision of what's down the road. You have to be thinking two, three, four, five years away. As a CEO, that's what you do. With obviously a focus on the now as well. And all of this stuff goes into you being a great business owner and having fabulous, famous employees because it all goes back to giving a great experience for the patient, and that's what it takes today. But you better darn well be ready for the change. Otherwise, it can't happen. Can't happen. Enjoy talking to you guys today. Make sure you check out the YouTube station. If you go check it out and it's not up there, it just simply means the team's still in edit mode. But it'll be up there uh, probably in three business days following uh, the launch of this podcast. But thanks for listening today, guys. Hope you got some good knowledge out of this. And we're also going to go in in future podcasts. We're going to go back into these stages. And I'm going to teach how you get people out of it. So if you're a doctor and you go, you know, golly, I've got five team members in the pre-contemplation phase. What do I do? Well, we're going to create a podcast for each one of these phases as well, okay? And that's upcoming. A lot of content. We can't get it all. We can't get it all out at once. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed it today. I love talking to you guys. It means the world uh, that you guys follow the podcast and listen. And I really, really hope it changes your lives for the better, your employees' lives, and of course, consumers out there who you call patients. Appreciate it, guys. You guys enjoy the rest of your week. Talk to you soon.